So uh, my goal here is to empower <laughs> all of you guys to start your own meetups. So this is an appropriate <clears throat> sort of thing here to do. That felt great. <laughs> so uh, my name is Harry Schwartz. I am a developer at a company called Thoughtbot. We're a uh, web design and mobile consultancy doing mostly Ruby stuff. We're in Boston, San Francisco, New York, and like a dozen other places. It's getting huge. Um, I'm here because my coworker, Eric, and I started Emacs NYC uh, about a year and a half ago. So Emacs NYC is a, let's see, I can alt tab? Alt tab, very good. We are a meetup focusing on the Emacs in New York. Uh, is this large enough to see? There we go. Uh, can you? Boop. There we go. Awesome. Beautiful. Cool. Uh, ignore that next event. I think we ignored updating that for a moment. But um, we're a meetup. We have uh, talks every month, uh, which we record and put online and uh, make available as well. Uh, make available as uh, videos through both YouTube and uh, downloadable through WebMs and other stuff if you prefer a non-YouTube solution. And uh, we've been meeting about every month for a little bit over a year. And it's uh, been going pretty good. So I'm going to talk about what we did, how that worked, uh, what you shouldn't do, and what you can do to start your own meetup if you're into that kind of thing, which you should be because it's great. So uh, Eric and I are the two Emacs users in our whole company of about 100 people. Uh, Thoughtbot is a big Vim shop. And uh, as you can imagine, we felt you know, pretty oppressed living under the uh, jackboot of Vim tyranny. <laughs> so we decided that we were going to have to do something to you know, liberate ourselves. So we decided to get together and start an Emacs meetup so we could find other people and you know, not feel so very, very alone in the world. So, here's how you do this. Uh, first of all, I strongly recommend you find some kind of co-founder. Eventually, you'll want to find a sponsor because it's expensive to do all this stuff. You need space, you need food, you need all this stuff. Um, you'll need somewhere to post things, which is a problem. Uh, you'll need a plan for food. You'll need all the technical nonsense, which is what we're all really interested in, but is really the least important part of organizing a up. Uh, you'll need to find speakers. You'll need to make them do things for you. You'll need to make the community a pleasant place to be, where people interact with each other in a way that you want. Uh, and you need to not screw up all kinds of other things that I'll talk about at the end. So, uh, finding a co-founder. Um, you can organize a meetup alone, but it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot of work, and you need someone to like go downstairs and open the door when it turns out the door locks after 6 p.m. Or someone to be there to answer the phone when the delivery guy comes with pizza and you're trying to introduce a speaker. Like it's just it's just hard. You need more people. You need friends, and you need friends. Uh, running a meetup is stressful. Um, things can go wrong, and it's hard. And it's nice to have someone there to uh, help you out and put your uh, rest, rest, rest your head on their shoulder, as it were. You need a sponsor. Um, in our case, our company, ThoughtBot, despite being uh, a Vim shop, is very welcoming uh, in terms of supporting meetups. So we said, hey guys, could we have money and space and food and stuff? And they said, sure, go nuts, which is wonderful. Um, we were pretty lucky in that way. It's kind of hard to find a good sponsor. I don't really have any good tips for that because we lucked out, but it's pretty important. You have a ton of expenses. Uh, you need to pay for food, there's web hosting, there's meetup.com, which is very expensive. It's like $90 for six months for meetup.com. It's super pricey uh, once, once you get to a certain scale and have a certain number of meetups. It's bonkers, but you don't want to pay that yourself. Um, you also need recording equipment and, you know, someone to record stuff for you correctly and turn it into a video that you would want to see. And that's all pretty pricey. Also, when you have a sponsor, you should thank them. Uh, that's sort of your duty. Um, everyone is pretty okay with that. If they show up at a meetup and they're given free food and they're entertained, 
they're sort of expecting to pay by listening to a pitch of some kind. So, you know, go hire ThoughtBot. We're pretty great. If you want some Ruby. And Good Shop. And Good Shop, which is awesome. <laughs> and hiring! Ooh. Yeah. Um, you want a lot of regularity. So, you know, apparently children thrive on consistency. I, I don't know. Um, but meetups do too. So the more things you can do in a regular way, the better. So when we got our meetup started, we, well, so ThoughtBot in New York was working in a WeWork, which is a co-working space. And WeWork is pretty nice, and there are about a dozen of them in Manhattan. But unfortunately, every month we were in a different WeWork for about a year straight. Uh, we duplicated it a few times. But it made planning really difficult because no one really knew where to go, and people would show up at the wrong end of the island sometimes, and every building has different security systems. Some of them lock the bathrooms after 6 p.m., which is bonkers. Uh, others are super lax, and it's really hard to plan for when you don't know where you're going to be all the time. So you really need some kind of consistency. Emacs NYC has since moved into ThoughtBot's permanent office, which exists now in New York, so everything just got a lot easier, but you know, there for a while, kind of rough. You don't want to move. Also, uh, in the way of consistency, try to meet on a regular schedule. So meet every month. Uh, meet every month whether you have a speaker or not. If you can't find somebody, well, guess what? It's, it's hack meetup time or something. Or you, the organizer, can give a lightning talk if you really, really have to. Be, you know, every now and then the speaker will fall through or get stuck in traffic in Jersey or just disappear off the face of the earth every now and then, which is obnoxious. Um, and you need to be prepared for that. Uh, but whether or not that happens, you need to meet. You need to keep a pattern going. That's pretty important. There are also a thousand questions that you need to deal with there in terms of space. Um, doors lock. Uh, like shops lock up and you don't know when sometimes and people get trapped outside and then suddenly they're messaging you on meetup.com like, can you let me in? And you're trying to listen to a talk and it's, ah, it's terrible. Um, sometimes uh, a, you know, a business will need a list of names, like who's getting in and meetup doesn't provide that information. And Emacs people tend to be the kinds of people that want to provide pseudonyms or no name or not register anyway. Uh, I'll, get to, I'll get to some of that a little bit later too. Um, so that's problematic. Um, also, if you're working in a co-working space, uh, it can be unfortunate because people want to, you know, eat your food. Like, you get food, and then suddenly some little startup drifts in, and they're like, hey guys, what are you doing? <laughs> and that's, uh, that's no good. So you got to work with that. So regarding food, um, we do the worst thing, which is also the easiest thing which is getting pizza and beer. Um, it's real easy. Pizza is just sort of the expected thing, and because it's so expected, no one will ever complain about it, but no one's ever really excited about it either. And I think the people that think it's most okay are also most likely to be people that are already exactly like us. Like, I think beardy white guys are pretty okay with getting pizza and what else is, but that's, I get to that in inclusiveness stuff. But also you want to have some other options, right? Like if you only get pizza and there are people who don't eat gluten, then you're kind of a jerk. Uh, same thing with vegan options. I mean, provide those, of course, if you can. Um, one time we, we actually, in order to avoid changing our patterns too much, we got some vegan gluten-free pizza and uh, that wasn't very good. <laughs> Anyway, so you also need to do a lot of technical groundwork stuff. You need to organize the, the internet part of the meetup. And this is the part that we tend to be most interested in, um, which is kind of a shame because it's also the part that matters the least. If you're trying to build a community and get people together in a physical place, really the least important part is whether your site is made in org mode or not. Uh, that's great and all, but it's like it doesn't it doesn't matter really. Uh, it is cool. Um, 
Meetup.com is the thing that everyone expects you to be on. I don't especially like Meetup.com. It's really expensive. You need to register for it. Uh, it wants to get your name. It wants to know stuff about you. I don't like that. I use PGP. That creeps me out, you know. But it's what everyone expects you to be on. And if you're not on it, no one will show up to your Meetup. And that's, that's a bummer. So deal with it. Get ready to drop some money. However, you should also have a website and a blog. Something with RSS. There are people that will not get on Meetup. And, uh, you know, that's usually an ethical choice. And I think of that as kind of being like veganism, where it's like, well, okay, you've, you've made an ethical choice, and I don't want to thwart you on it. So try to provide something like that. Also, if you have a blog, then you can post videos and all kinds of other helpful things that Meetup is not very good at. So I like to do both. Uh, recording video is tricky. We have a microphone, we have a video camera, and we have an assortment of tripods in business. Um, we got those all from ThoughtBot. ThoughtBot does a lot of recording video stuff for meetups, so we, we got those for, for free, essentially. Um, what we do is we take all of those uh, bits of video that we get. We, get a, we, have a, we record a screencast on the presenter's computer. We record audio from a microphone that's next to them. And then we also uh, video them from the back. And we send those all off to ThoughtBot's uh, producer, who is great at AV stuff. And we just have him on staff, so that's convenient. Um, and he knits them all together into a pleasant video and uploads it to YouTube, um, which is great. Not a lot of people have that, so we, we really lucked out there. But if you, if you don't have that, if your sponsor doesn't already have that, it's really great to try and find a professional who can do that kind of thing for you, because we're all good at computers and everything, but we're usually not good at anything involving video production as a rule. Um, so hosting video. Uh, we host things on YouTube because bandwidth and YouTube and everyone will discover it and find it and stuff. But some people do not like YouTube um, for all kinds of totally valid ethical reasons. Uh, as a result, we also take the video, transcode it into WebM, which is a free and pretty pleasant format and uh, host it on our website, uh, so it's available as a download. Mm -hmm. That's arguably not quite as convenient as streaming, but that's okay. If you're trading convenience for ethical choices, then that seems perfectly reasonable to me, and we're trying to cater to that also. Here's a picture from one of our talks. Uh, sometimes we kind of need to hack things together. We didn't have our microphone tripod here, so uh, our speaker had a uh, big stack of books, with the plaster head of a bear that was on the co-working space's wall with a microphone stuck in its mouth. And that worked pretty well. Everyone learned a lot about keyboard macros. It was a good day. All right, organizing speakers. So you're probably gonna need to talk a lot yourself, um, so make sure you're comfortable with the idea of that. Uh, I'm pretty okay with making a fool of myself in front of an audience, as it's probably becoming clear. So that's not too much of an issue there, but, you know, get used to it. Um, you're probably going to want to give the first talk or two uh, just to sort of prime the pump so that speakers have an idea, potential speakers who have attended, have an idea of what's expected of giving a talk at your meetup. Um, you'll need to find volunteers. Usually people will just show up and say, hey, I'd like to give a talk. You'll also often need to hassle people. Speaking of hassling, uh, so meetup.com allows you to uh, ask questions of people when they meet, join a meetup. I'm sure you all have seen this if you're on there. Um, we ask people the question, uh, we ask them, what's your experience with Emacs? Like, what, how, much, how much have you done with it? And would you be interested in giving a talk sometime? And it was funny because we got a bunch of people who said, uh, you know, what's your experience? Well, I've been using it for 32 years. Would you be interested in giving a talk? I don't know what I'd talk about. And I just want to shake them, because what, what, what do you mean? You don't know what you talk about. Come on, anything, just tell me about your life. You sound awesome. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe not exactly, but you know, anyway, so you know, uh, sometimes uh, you need to volunteer people a little bit. Sometimes they need a little nudge. Um, 
And those people, you know, don't like say, hey, you, you're giving a talk right now. Come on up. Uh, but, you know, say, hey, how about you talk about that thing that you were bragging about the other day? It sounds wonderful. Uh, you know, and usually you can provide polite pressure such that they'll do it. Obviously, don't actually make anyone uncomfortable. That's not your goal. You want people to be happy giving a talk. But, you know, you can give them a little nudge in a courteous way. Another option is finding people that aren't actually into Emacs, um, but that will talk about things that would be of interest to your meetup. Uh, for example, uh, Christmas last year, we had a holiday key signing party uh, where we invited a coworker of mine uh, to give a talk on PGP, and he did, and it was terrific, and then we had a key signing party. And what better way to celebrate the holidays than through strong crypto? Uh, What's that? Could anything be nerdy? Could anything be nerdy? Uh, probably. I, I, not much. Uh, which reminds me, if anyone wants to sign keys later, come talk to me. Uh, so once you've got a lead, uh, follow up. I originally said hound them, but then I realized that seemed pretty rude. Uh, follow up. One thing that we do is we have a speaker's guide. Let me show that off. So. Uh, we have this. We have this GitHub account, which is Emacs NYC. We have our website here, and we also have a repo called Meeting Logistics. All of this is public, by the way, so feel free to poke around in there. Um, oops, that was the wrong one. Uh, and we have a speaker's guide, which is just a little markdown document, and it says what we want out of a speaker. So, what we need to get them, you know, lined up for a talk which is you know, an abstract, a title, some information about them, uh, a list of things that they should do before their talk so that we can do things like recording their talk, and, you know, projecting their computer onto our screen and stuff, um, and some basic suggestions for what they should do during a talk. By the way, uh, I don't think any speaker has ever read this section about uh, installing the screen recording software beforehand. It's really hard to get people to do that. So it's always happening right, right before the talk. And it's like, oh no, panic. What fun. Uh, so also try and like offer to help them out. So say, hey, I'd be happy to review your slides. Uh, if you want to rehearse with me, I'll try and make some time. People appreciate that. And sometimes they take you up on it. So, uh, we're doing a meetup, which is ultimately about community building. And unfortunately, if we were to, say, look around this room, for example, uh, we would notice a certain homogeneity amongst us, which is that we're mostly beardy white guys. Um, and that's not, you know, there's nothing wrong with being one of those, but, it, you know, it's, it's not terribly diverse. And it would be nice to have some other people in our community. There are a lot of things that we can do to help that out. Uh, one easy one that's great is to uh, have a code of conduct. I noticed in the beginning of this uh, conference that we do, which is, which is wonderful. It's not something I expected, and I'm thrilled that we do. Uh, j just, just because it's not, you know. We also had a big lunch. I know, we did. <laughs> I noticed. I was thrilled. Uh, yeah, which is all good stuff. Um, have a code of conduct, and have it before something goes wrong. Uh, we've, we've never had an incident. But I'm, you know, I, I'd like, I think it makes people more comfortable. Um, so that's a nice thing to do. Uh, Hacker School, school now, now the Recurse Center, um, has a set of social rules, which I really love. And they're just good, actually, they're just good rules for being a human being, but they're especially good in a meetup. Uh, one of them is no feigning surprise. So you can't be like, you don't know who RMS is? What's wrong with you? Because that's a jerk thing to do. Um, you can't say, well, actually, which means that when someone is presenting something and you have a minor quibble with a technical point that has nothing to do with the thrust of their argument, you can't point it out and try and make them feel bad. Because that's a, why would you do that? What's wrong with you? Um, don't backseat drive, which means don't interrupt someone else's, you know, communication, learning experience, and no subtle isms, like racism, sexism. My grandmother could do this. Don't say that. That's rude. 
Uh, also, having a variety of foods. I mean, hey, we had vegan falafel lunch, which is wonderful. Um, and it's, it's nice to have a variety there. Uh, furthermore, this one's sort of trickier because I think it's fun and it's, it's kind of cool when you have people that have been using Emacs since, you know, the ENIAC. Uh, it's, it's neat to hear from them and I love to. But there also becomes a sort of awkward, uh, like, uh, it's just uncomfortable. Like, if, if you're fairly new to the community and everyone there has been using Emacs uh, since before the Berlin Wall fell, then, you know, ugh. So try not to emphasize how much more experienced everyone is than other people. That tends to put people off. Uh, relatedly, try and organize events that are friendly to new people. So if all of your events are, you know, anaphoric macros in ELISP, then you're going to lose a lot of people because sometimes you need to talk about syntax highlighting. Uh, so, you know, be prepared to mix it up a little bit. Also, feel free to go to other events and uh, say, hey, come on over. People usually like that. It's kind of fun. Offer to do joint events with other meetups. It's not that hard. Usually people are like, hey, you'll help chip in for food? Sure, let's team up. Uh, and that gets people who would otherwise not even know that you existed uh, interested, which is great. The other angle on this, aside from like the usual kinds of diversity that we want in the tech community, is uh, free software folks. Emacs, in particular, has a whole bunch of them. And, you know, obviously we want to include everybody, so, but, but, Emacs in particular has uh, a bunch of them, so it's kind of a special case. Uh, so one thing that's really great for that is licensing. Be good about it. License your software in a way that is compliant with you know, FSF guidelines. Um, use Creative Commons, use the GPL. Everyone appreciates that. And it's not like you lose anything by it. Uh, similarly, try and provide free options. So rather than only using meetup.com, uh, provide something with an RSS feed so that people can subscribe to your site and get updates without needing to mm -hmm. create an account on a site that they don't like. Um, similarly, avoid JavaScript in that site. People tend not to like that. Uh, use AUG or WebM or something for your videos so that people can watch it without having to use non-free software. Uh, all of these things are kind of mm -hmm. like finicky points, it sounds like, unless you're in that. But really, I kind of think of it as the, the software equivalent of veganism, you know? It's like we want to make it comfortable for everybody, and this is part of that. Uh, it's not hard to do. Generally, be respectful of folks' ethical choices. I feel like I'm speaking at an Emacs conference, so probably this is preaching to the choir. But for a lot of people, it's not obvious. So I think it's good to say. So anti-patterns. Uh, you are your own worst enemy. You will try and screw this up in various ways. Uh, for example, you will try to use Emacs for everything under the sun. Um, now, uh, I don't want to say anything bad about anybody, but uh, using Emacs as your web server for your, <laughs> is not like, it's cool, and it's really cool, and it's fun, and if you're in college, that's a great thing to do. But if your goal is to build a meetup and not to, you know, have a learning experience with Emacs, then maybe you're not optimizing for the right thing, right? Uh, so uh, similarly, not being consistent about stuff, uh, like I said before, totally a problem. Um, we also tend to assume that everyone's a programmer. This was mentioned earlier, but there are a ton of mathematicians and physicists and like sci-fi writers that use Emacs. <coughs> And if we sort of target all of our events toward, you know, how to do Python in Emacs, then we're going to lose some people. And that's unfortunate. Not that we shouldn't do some of that, but we should mix it up a little bit. Another anti-pattern is trying to do everything yourself. So because we're computer people, we tend to assume that anything on a computer is a thing that we're good at or can learn to be good at pretty easily. Uh, and just in general, you know, there's a lot of hubris there. So, you know, if we want to design a logo, usually we'll design the logo ourselves rather than asking a designer, uh, which is totally okay, but you can get better results from a designer. 
rather than trying to do it in artist mode or something, right? Like, that's not a great idea. Uh, it totally works, and, you know, uh, six other people will get it when they see it, but is that what you want? It's kind of cool. Uh, similarly, AV stuff is hard. Hire somebody. Uh, they'll do it better than you can. So, here are the takes away, takeaways of this talk. This is what you should get out of it. Uh, get help. Find people that are smarter or uh, friendlier or wealthier than you and uh, have them assist you in things. Uh, try and be consistent. Don't change things up. Uh, same time, same place, people like that. Keep the meeting similar. People like to know what to expect. Be actively inclusive. So put out a code of conduct, establish social rules, do these things beforehand, not just sort of in a reactive way and not in a sort of our only rule is don't be a jerk way because that isn't a rule at all. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything specific to anybody. And try not to get bogged down in technical specifics, right? There's a, actually, let me show you the, the GitHub repo of our website, which has, as its one little comment here, this site's not in org mode. You guys are phonies. It's not, we don't care. It's not the problem. That's not the point we're trying to solve. So don't get bogged down in that. If org mode is the easiest thing for you, totally go for that. But uh, ThoughtPot does a lot of stuff in Markdown. We already knew Markdown. Uh, so we went with that, and that got the job done, and that's what we wanted. These are a few resources. Uh, the top two are us. Uh, feel free to clone repos. We have a website. Take it and change it. That's great. We have some meeting logistics stuff. We have a code of conduct that's adapted from the wonderful PyLadies code of conduct, which is also available. Uh, we have that speaker's guide. Take those things and do things with them. That's wonderful. Um, the Recurse Center's social rules are just great. There's a link to them. And also, there was a great talk I attended last year at Gotham Ruby Conference by Luke Melia about uh, growing a meetup. Uh, specifically, he was talking about the Ember.js meetup in New York. But, uh, you know, that one's pretty good, too. Uh, I recommend that talk. So, uh, I'm Harry Schwartz. I am available at uh, harryrschwartz.com and through hello at harryrschwartz.com. If you feel the need to send me encrypted email, that's the key to use. And, uh, not that you would. <laughs> Why would you? Anyway, but it's fun for me. Um, let's see. Also, I haven't made this point clear yet, but uh, Emacs NYC still exists. It's run by my co-founder, but I, a couple months ago, moved to Boston. Uh, so I'm about to start Boston, uh, Boston Emacs. So if anyone's interested in that, let me know. We should talk. Yeah. Isn't there already like tons of Emacs and this group in Boston? No. No? Surprise twist. Really? So there used to be a list meet up there. And uh, it ran for a while. And then um, one of the, the, the main guy that ran it works at Google. And he moved down to the New York office. Uh, so the list meetup is, seems to be on, on indefinite hiatus. And I'm not aware of an Emacs meetup there. Now, whether or not there's one somewhere deep in the bowels of MIT, I don't know. I can only assume that there is somewhere. Uh, but it's not public. Hey, it's, it's not on meetup.com. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. I think, there, uh, I think it'll be fun to get this thing started. I think we're going to have some neat people coming out of the woodwork. Uh, I can't wait. It's going to be fun. So uh, this is the end of the talk. What questions do you have? Did I just alienate everyone? Yeah. <laughs> is that a water box logo? Uh, it is not even my computer, but... It is the developer Firefox logo. Oh, okay. They're just handing out stickers. Sweet. Is that like a librarian's conference? Cool. Yeah. That sounds fun, actually, <laughs> weirdly enough. I notice, I notice you're a Beamer. Uh, it is not even my computer, but... It is the developer Firefox logo. Oh, okay. They're just handing out stickers. Sweet. Is that like a librarian's conference? Cool. Yeah. That sounds fun, actually. Fun. Weirdly enough. I notice, I notice you're a Beamer user. I am a Beamer I just user. I say Beamer is awesome. Beamer is awesome. It makes making presentations better if people are going to be making things for your meetup group. Exactly. We have, uh, we have a, a number of Beamer users.
Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, so you know you can do org export through uh, LaTeX, and one of the things you can do is make slides with org mode into Beamer, and it looks really pretty sometimes. I didn't actually do that this time, but it's cool when you do. Yeah. I was going to ask exactly the same thing, <laughs> but now I'll just say I think your um, Emacs and NYC logo is fantastic. Either yeah. one of you was a designer or maybe you took Wrong. advice and yeah. got a designer. I did. So uh, the, the second one, I don't know anything about design. I'm terrible at it. I would have done, it would have just been a big pile of parentheses uh, if I had done it. Um, so no, we asked uh, Will McMahon, who's another ThoughtBot employee, and we, we kind of cornered him and said, hey, we're going to make a terrible logo. This is our draft. And then we just looked at him. And then he said, no, 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 no. And then, uh, then it, it turned out pretty okay. It was great. Uh, yeah. How many people do you get coming on a regular basis? Oh, man. So let me, uh, let me say how many people are in the meetup group first, because that's a more impressive number. Uh, <laughs> so we have, we have 280 members about right now, which makes us the largest Emacs-themed meetup in the world that I'm aware of. Uh, as for how many actually show up, 20 or 30. Uh, it, it depends, sometimes sometimes more, sometimes less. It depends on topic and time of year. Summers are usually kind of slow. Yeah? Is there a lot of recording and cause quality of the speaker to go up? Does recording the event cause the quality of the speaker to go up? Um, uh, I think sometimes. Um, we, we've had a couple really just excellent speakers. Uh, so Perry Metzger in particular, who, who actually spoke at the Penn Emacs Club one time, uh, came up from Philly and spoke for us, which was awesome. He traveled. Usually it's all just local folks. Um, and he gave a talk. And we have like 40,000 views on YouTube. It's so cool. But um, I'm just bragging. I'm sorry. That's not an answer. Uh, do I think it makes uh, the quality of speakers go up? I'm not sure it changes it. But I think that by distributing videos and getting known for that kind of thing, eventually it'll make it easier for us to yeah, attract more people. Oh, oh I, I mean, in a, in a purely selfish way, I think over time, as people get to know, oh, Emacs NYC puts out good videos, I think it'll be easier to lure more well known folks in from further away. But that's just a. a uh, a, a theory that has not yet been substantiated at all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I do the recording. Um, so we have <laughs> AV people on staff. Uh, his name's Tom. <laughs> He's up in Boston. And uh, I, I do the recording. So I record the microphone stuff, <laughs> the screencast, and the video. And then I send that up to him. And he does all the editing and makes it available to me. And then I transcode it into a free format because I don't think that's really what Tom's into. Uh, Do you have any advice on doing the recording itself? On the recording itself? Um, I have a lot of specific little things. Like, uh, if we had a microphone, we would want to be moving this over here and putting the microphone here because having the microphone between the speaker and the... Uh, Presentation is better because they tend to lean that way and then it still catches them. Um, you can't really have too much light. Cameras like light. Uh, if you have the camera positioned in such a way that it has people's heads in the very bottom of the frame, the camera will focus on them and completely unfocus on the speaker and then your video will be terrible. Sorry about those first two we did. Um, there are a bunch of little things like that. Uh, I, I think, actually, I put a couple of them... Oh, I forgot about the you guys are phonies thing. I think I put a couple of them in the meeting logistics business here. I have a logistics document which says some stuff about what, what, what things you need. Uh, cameras and, like, plastic solo cups and signs to put on the doors and tape because y you want a checklist. Spare batteries. Oh, video tape. There's a fancy video camera in that bag down there, but I forgot to bring tape for it. So, uh, oh man! Yeah. Filming with a phone. It's it's an SD card in our case, and yeah. it just lives in the camera, so we usually. 
But uh, it, yeah, here's some here are some specific things that we found that were useful. Like having a little mini tripod for the recorder was good. Just, just all kinds of little specific things like that. Yeah, sure. What else you got? Yeah. On governance? Mm -hmm. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. So I've got some thoughts on that. Uh, so what what we did was uh, it was me and my co-founder Eric, and I. So I'm I'm still at Thoughtbot. Thoughtbot has a number of offices. I just switched offices, so we still are in pretty good contact. Um, but we got someone else from the meetup uh, and sort of, you know, uh, we pretty much rule it as like an autocracy. We just kind of decide who's mm -hmm. going to pick things, which is a way to do it. And it's kind of nice because it's never unclear what's going on. It's just a dictatorship. Um, that said, uh, if you want to, you could totally come up with a more complex but probably less efficient scheme for doing that. Um, some kind of election system would probably be great. Uh, the danger with that is that it takes it takes a lot of effort to organize a group that can elect members and stuff. And it doesn't take that much effort to organize an Emacs meetup. Like, I'm painting it here as if it's really hard, but seriously, you know, I have a day job and stuff. It's not that bad. Uh, so it's possible that you might be putting in so much work to do that kind of organization that you're not really, that, that it's kind of, it kind of isn't worth it at that point. I mean, I, I can only do so much harm also. Like, anyone can register a meetup. If I decide, you know, bring me the head of all of your firstborn, then everyone can just leave. You know, it's no big deal. So, I don't know. I, I haven't worried about it too much, but that's a valid point. Cool. What else you got? Are there any other questions uh, in person? If I can read off some from um, <coughs> from IRC. Cool. So. Um, just a couple of comments from uh, Sasha and CMAC. They both think the fact that Emacs NYC has a list of talk ideas is awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank and you. they like went through them and they were like, oh, these are all really cool. Yeah, I would love to see all of them. I <laughs> 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 that would be great. I forget where I put it, but it's there somewhere. Uh, give a talk. Yeah, there's a whole list of them here. Uh, in the very beginning, we decided that we kind of needed to prime the pump somehow to get people involved in speaking. So we made a big list of talks that we would like to see and uh, made it available. And I think people have used it a little bit. So. Cool. And um, I'm just bunching some of these together. Mm -hmm. Seth Diego thinks that uh, the guides you put together have been pretty awesome. And oh, cool. We probably should have looked at those before we organized Emacs Conf <laughs> because you figured out a bunch of stuff that we independently did also. Hmm. Um, and you did a pretty good job so far. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Sasha likes the fact that, the fact that the videos are posted cool. after the meetup. And Ses Diego has a question. Uh, when was the last time someone presented in a PowerPoint as opposed to going just through Emacs? Not on my watch. <laughs> uh, no, so a, a bunch of people don't use Emacs for presentations. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them do, I mean, obviously. But, uh, you know, sometimes people use Beamer. Some, I think we've had at least a couple. Let's see, George did his own cobbled together thing that he likes, which is basically constructing a web page and then scrolling through it. Um, we haven't had any PowerPoints yet. Maybe we had a keynote, but I'm, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just had a note shouting out to the social rules. Cause yeah. I'm wearing my hacker school shirt. Yeah, rock um, on. Yeah, that was like my favorite part about hacker school. Oh, wait, Alex went there too. What was that? Oh, we're Curse Center now. Curse yeah. Center, yeah. Um, but it's just like a list of things that like I have done and that like 
that I didn't realize were harmful, mm-hmm. and it was just like good to know, and it was awesome having a community where like people like tried really hard to yeah. just be like good people. I found that really helpful because I've well actually a lot of oh, yeah. people, and oh, it yeah. has not done any good for anyone ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gives you like a nice perspective. Yep. Um, and then one question from CMAC. So they're asking, now that you're moving to a new Emacs group, uh, do you think you'll be tempted to point to a previous Emacs talk video rather than retalking it? And I assume they mean like playing the talk uh, during the meetup oh. instead of. Um, so I. I think there are two things they can mean. Uh, one, right. we, def- we definitely won't play any talks during the meetups unless things get unless things get pretty desperate. <laughs> uh, I, that I don't I don't feel like that really brings the community together very well. Yeah. Um, but if if alternately they mean will we give a talk on the same topic more or less? Uh, we may well. Like we did a we did a talk on Python and Emacs about a year and a half ago. You know, in another year, that situation may have changed, so it might be relevant to revisit that. So we might do a little bit of duplication, but mm-hmm. obviously, I mean, there, there are a lot of things here that I don't know, so I sure hope people talk about. So hopefully we won't have too much of that. Yeah. Um, Anything else? Anyone in person? Cool. So um, Sasha just had uh, one comment. Um, she asks, if there's time, maybe we can briefly describe the Twitch plus Jitsi setup that we have uh, running right now. I would like to hear about that yeah. sometime. So yeah. I can talk about that very quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, you come and talk about it because there was, uh, we had, we were trying to get IceCast to work for the first two weeks. We got IceCast to weeks. work, except that, and, and you know, IceCast, the, the server part of IceCast works fine. Um, the problem was that the FFmpeg screen capture um, you know, that uploads to IceCast works fine at Noisebridge, works fine at his house, doesn't mm-hmm. work here. <laughs> and, um, you know, when we think that something is wrong, we didn't mess with the port numbers, we should have forget. Um, oh, we, yeah. We, we just <laughs> think that, that the, 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 like, maybe the, the AT&T, you know, DSL upload is just too spotty. Mm-hmm. But I don't understand how Twitch is able to work, or maybe it isn't working too well. Yeah. Um, but, um, but the, the FFmpeg would just drop its connection to that server, and and so one, um, so we got it working at this other place, and we just sort of assumed that it would work here. And last night we we came to, to you know set it up ahead of time. You know it's not connecting, and we thought we'd broken the configuration, and then <coughs> they were right at his house, so it worked there. So so <laughs> this is something to get working at your actual venue. Um, you know, with the actual same equipment ahead of time sure. and source control everything that you do because you're not sure, otherwise you're not sure if you like do something <laughs> and then untweaked it the wrong way. Um, this is uh, related to the fact that we have not yet tried to live cast on Emacs NYC. <laughs> it was, it, it was a pretty cool idea sure. um, and, and IceCast works really well and we did this with a three and a half dollar per month VPS server. Um, <laughs> And we were showing movies on it and so forth, just just to exercise the server, and that was working nice. And we were commenting on it. So, um, um, so uh, FFmpeg is a little bit mysterious. You you have a version of it there. We can distribute the sure. the, the commands that, that we use that sort of almost work here. Um, I would not want to use Twitch. That was sort of our last resort that sure. we went to last night. So so uh, um, FFmpeg plus Jitsi plus IceCast. Um, uh, that's kind of center's co- combination, and that yeah. that that actually worked really well, except for the internet problems. Um, yeah. And yeah, so you show yourself on the Jitsi screen, and then IceCast is X11 grab, and then cool. sending it up to IceCast, and, and then people can um, interact over IRC, and uh, you know you can have have them in a small window on Jitsi, and so we were thinking of having like an Emacs talk show where where cool. somebody would be on and then people would call in and ask questions using Jitsi. I, I would love to know the setup that you guys are doing. If if, if that yeah, if yeah. that all clicks into place and you guys made a you know like a glorified blog post about it, that would be amazing. I would love that documentation to exist. Yeah, look at look at get uh, emacsconf two hundred fifteen dot org. Get uh, dot emacs. Is it public? Conf. Uh, 
dot uh, two o fifteen dot. I, I don't have the structure right. up now. I'll put it there. Sure. But we, oh, dogs. We, we, we've got our own because um, some of us don't like to use YouTube, and some of us like also don't like to use GitHub. So. Um, oh yeah, sure. That that's something that I'm yeah, still okay, kind of thinking like about. But for Hertz. Yeah, uh, I I'm with you. So so uh, so we have our own uh, you know Git site. Sure, I understand. And, uh, um, so we'll, we'll put those scripts up there. That would be wonderful. I'd, I'd love to see that. And not just scripts, but like a written explanation of why you made the decisions you made, too. Because yeah. I, I would like to steal that information yeah, sure, and make sure, use sure. of it. Uh, also, relatedly, I, I'm sure you guys know about this, but um, at Libre Com Planet this year, which is the Free Software Foundation's annual conference, um, they live streamed everything and they did it all with 100% free software. Yeah. And I have no idea how they did it, but it sounds awesome. I like, did they document that? Uh, uh, really? I don't know if they did it, but uh, okay. uh, Chaos Computer Club does that too. Oh, they have they have a really fancy. Uh, oh, do they? Yeah, but they they also transcoded into like 179 different formats for like yep. you know iPads and stuff like this. Cool. So their setup is really complicated, but they documented. it. Okay. And, um, so our our stuff, you know, kind of ripped a little bit from the, from them. Sure. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't I didn't realize they did that, but yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. And I've got the URL. Okay, something else I need to look at. Cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll write up something afterwards. I would love that. Please yeah. do. And like the cool thing about Jitsi Meet is that um, that Sasha wanted me to mention was that uh, it's relatively easy to get someone else's computer to share their screen if they have Chrome or Chrome U installed. Um, and and that's, it's supposed to work with Firefox Nightly, but for some reason it doesn't work with 40. So. Yeah, and it's like, with the Nightly, it doesn't let them share the screen. But, well, I'll well, um, see in six weeks or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It'll come through. Um, so so I, I like it much better than anything like Skype, and it's all free software. Nice. Yeah, and this Minimum. works surprisingly well. And so my computer is the only one that needs to know how to live stream. Cool. But yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah. Questions? Anybody else? Comments? if you had an Emacs server running on a server somewhere and you had people attached to it somehow, maybe you could do something. But I have no idea how I'd do that. Uh, you ever use Tmux? Yeah, Tmux would totally do it. Yeah, so there's this thing called Tmate. It lets you do some sort of, they host some server that connects, makes a tunnel to your Tmux engine. And so you can just give anyone the GUI, you know, GUI encoded uh, Tmate URL with an SSH, and they can just SSH. SSH into that, and it connects them to your SSH session, and you can both code on that. There's a thing called Screen Hero, and I can't remember exactly how it works or what it does, but I know that there are people at my company that like to uh, do remote pairing, and I know that they use it. So there's a, a keyword that I can't back up with any other information. But. <laughs> oh, could it be? That, that's totally plausible. Thoughtbot is mostly Max. Yeah, uh, and then we have one comment from IRC from Cantern, and they recommend Fluvits, F-L-O-O-B-I-T-S. Um, apparently it works with Emacs and over the network, and it's like Google Docs with text editors, and that sounds cool. And they use a lot of exclamation marks, so they're very excited about it. So it might be something cool. to check out. Yeah. Oh, that's something you can do too. Yeah. Cool. Uh, anyone else? Cool. So that was, yeah, that was really, really cool. Cool. Thank you.